um, semantics can be very big things. Uh, if you look at this ballpark estimate of the number of pretty big step rule, of, sorry, small step rules uh, used in the formalization of some languages, uh, you can see that they can grow quite huge. And that's, that's a problem when uh, you want to define some derived semantics, like uh, an abstract uh, semantics, or you want to prove that these uh, derived semantics are correct, because there's a lot of proof of thought that needs to be done. But if you look a little more in detail at uh, what these semantics are made of, there are some common structures, some common elements. So here at the top, you have uh, the uh, if rule expressed in a big step semantic, and at the bottom expressed as some kind of algorithm. And they all share the same thing. There's a notion of sequence, like do some things and do something else. Uh, there's a notion of recursion, evaluate the subterm recursively to compute your uh, whole uh, thing. There's a notion of choice. Uh, for instance, in big step, you have two rules that may apply for the conditional. And uh, there is a notion of atom, black boxes, things that are not further detailed. For instance, comparing something to true or adding to integers. So to sum up, in uh, semantics, what you will find is a lot of structure, uh, sequence, recursion, choice, which is basically the way the control flow is going to uh, flow through uh, your uh, evaluation. And then at some point, you have black boxes, atoms. And uh, this is something uh, that we want to rely on, because uh, if you look more closely, in most programming languages, there are a lot of rules, but there are not that many atoms. And that's what we want to use. We want to have a way to uh, represent semantics by uh, exhibiting, highlighting the structure such that we can prove things in all generality for the structure part and only have a proof effort for the atoms bit. And uh, Peter O'Hearn yesterday said that uh, the drive uh, to develop infer was to analyze a million of lines of code. Well, our drive is to, be able, is to be able to manipulate semantics of real programming languages, such as JavaScript or, or other languages. So to do that, uh, what we introduce is what we call skeletal semantics. And that the outline of the talk will go from the left to the right. So first, let's talk about syntax. Let's design a syntax for semantics that captures the elements I described before. So here are what we call skeletons, and they, are, they consist of sequences of steps. So you still have your notion of sequence. Uh, you have no, your notion of recursion. Uh, we call them hooks because we don't know yet what kind of semantics we're defining, so we are just giving this kind of terminal that's saying, oh, at this place, we will evaluate E1 in state sigma to get V1, but we will need to hook your actual uh, evaluation here. There is a notion of choice, where you can have several things that uh, evaluate, and there are notion of atoms, as before. So that's what a skeleton uh, looks like. So formally, uh, if you want to write a skeleton uh, semantics for your favorite languages, what you need to do is to provide some terms. So we have base terms like integer, string, such like that. We have uh, term variables, and we have constructor applied to terms. So constructor can be a plus or the if or these kind of things. Then your semantics is going to be a bunch of skeletons which uh, say for every constructor what kind of behavior uh, you have associated to them. And the skeleton body is a sequence of steps, and each step is a bone, and the bone is either a hook, which is this kind of open recursion, it can be a choice between several branches, or a filter. Filters act both as functions, for instance, you want to add two numbers to get a new number, or as predicates. Uh, so in this slightly extended example, we have four filters. The lead to int and the add filters compute new values. Whereas the uh, is true and is false filters are predicate that may uh, pr uh, make a branch not be taken. Uh, and so we kind of put everything together in this notion of filter. But the idea is that they're all atoms. Uh, note that uh, in, the, in our rules, we have these special names uh, like the x sigma here and the xo. So x sigma represents a state at the beginning of uh, the execution, and xo is a state when we are finished. So that's a syntax to write, to describe the semantics. And in the paper, you can find a, a big example uh, showing you how we use that. Now let's give meaning to the semantics. And by meaning, we say, OK, how are we going to interpret them? 
So an interpretation of a semantics uh, basically consists of some input state on the output state, the, the, the domain of the interpretation. And then we interpret things, uh, sequences, sequentially. So for instance, let's say that you have this uh, skeleton body and you start from state uh, sigma one. And uh, well, to define an interpretation, you need to define how to interpret hooks. So that's given by the person defining the interpretation. And a hook from sigma one is going to say, well, we move to sigma two, so we can make some progress interpreting the body. And then the same thing for filters. For each filter, we assume that we are given a way to transform an interpretation state into a new interpretation state. And we make some progress. And then we reach to this uh, branching constructor. So to evaluate a branching, what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate every possible branch. So we duplicate the interpretation state. We gain some results. Some branches may not return anything because a filter blocked the interpretation. And then we need to find a way to merge everything together. So we assume we're given an operator to merge all these uh, results uh, with the initial state. And finally, we might reach the end of a uh, skeleton body, and we need to find a way to transform an interpretation state into an interpretation result. So to sum up, to define an interpretation, you give its domain, how to interpret the end of sequence, a hook, filters, and merging. And the important point is that only filter depends on your programming language because they are atoms. For the rest of them, they're defined completely independently of the programming language. So we decouple the definition of the semantics of the language from the way we interpret it. So let's look at some example. Uh, here is uh, an interpretation that is going to build a natural semantics uh, for your language. Uh, namely, build a set of triples from state sigma turns t evaluates to v. Uh, as usual, we're going to be evaluating terms that do not require a recursive, recursive call to the evaluation, such as literals that immediately give you a result. Then we will give, evaluate more complex terms based on the set of triples already computed, for instance, adding literal together or even more complex terms. So what we're going to do is build bigger and bigger sets of triples. And uh, our uh, interpretation reflects that. So at, at every point when we interpret things, we have a set of triples of already known evaluations. In addition, our interpretation state is going to have an environment uh, that maps the names occurring in the interpretation to some values. So let's look at an example. We are evaluating the if construct, if is an S1 else L, S, S2. So we have the body of uh, the skeleton for if. We assume that we already know how to compute uh, E, S1, and S2 in the triple set. And the initial state says that, well, sigma uh, is stored in name X sigma, and we have all, all the subterms stored in the names. So we need to evaluate the hook. How do we evaluate that? Well, uh, this is a recursive call, so intuitively we're going to look up in the set of triples uh, what known computation there was for uh, expression E in state sigma. Well, there is one, it's the first triple, and the result is false. So we can extend an environment uh, associating false to the name XF1. And we can proceed. Then we reach the choice. Well, at this point, there's no choice. We need to evaluate every branch. And for the first branch, uh, is true or false does not apply, so we throw the branch away. For the second branch, is false or false applies, so we can make progress. Now we need to find an evaluation for S2 in state sigma, and that's our last triple in our triple set. So we can say that XO now is bound to uh, S uh, sigma 2 in our uh, environment. We reach the end of the sequence, so we can transform that to some output. We have a choice to make between one thing, so that's easy. And now we are done, and we can read inside XO the uh, final uh, value of our evaluation. So formally, this is how we write it. Uh, we have all the rules that we uh, say before. For the merging, we can see that we pick one of the uh, branches that succeeded. If several branches succeed, then our uh, semantics uh, may be non-deterministic. And the crucial point here is that this interpretation is generic, and the only part it depends on the language considered is the actual implementation you're going to give for filters. For instance, how do you actually add two numbers together? 
Well, now, uh, oh, sorry, uh, and we need to put all of that together. So I said we will be, be building bigger and bigger and bigger triple sets. So we defined a functional from triple set to triple set that uh, tries every possible state sigma, every possible term t, see if there is a rule that gives us some result, and if there's a result v, then we add that to our triple, and we get a bigger triple set, and we take the smallest fixed point of this thing, and that's our uh, concrete semantics. So to switch to an abstract semantics, what we do is just put hashes everywhere. Uh, there is one tiny difference. It's for the uh, merging operator up there. Uh, we require every branch to succeed. It may return bottom if, if it was not valid, but we want every branch to succeed. And to merge all these branches, what we want is to take something that is bigger than all of them uh, in order for the uh, abstract semantics to be correct. And as before, the only language-specific uh, part of this interpretation is when we define the atom uh, for the abstract filter. So how do you abstractly add two integers, for instance? The uh, way to uh, put everything together is the exact same functional as before. We're going to be building bigger and bigger sets of triples. Uh, but now we want also to capture such some triples that are uh, kind of weird, such as why true do skip uh, yields bottom. And they're weird because they kind of re uh, need an infinite derivation to be captured. And to able to capture them, what we take is the largest fixed point of our function. So we've defined uh, some concrete and abstract interpretations. We can define other kind of interpretations, but since in the abstract interpretation session, uh, I'm focusing on that. And now, how do we prove that uh, what we did is correct? So we get to the last part of the talk, which is about the consistency of interpretations. So first, what do we mean by correct? Well, as soon as you have a triple in your abstract semantics, for every term that corresponds to the same term, if you have a state that is in the concretion of the abstract state, then the result, the value, must be in the concretion of the abstract value. In other words, an abstract triple captures every possible execution from related states and terms. So how do we prove that? We prove it using what we call interpretation consistency. Interpretation consistency is based on the idea that you have a a predicate relating states of your two interpretations and a predicate relating outputs of your two interpretations. And these, if these predicates are preserved by hooks, so they were, uh, they were related before and they are now related after, if they are preserved by filters, if they are well recursively preserved by running all the branching, then merging all the branching together, and by the end of sequence, then, of course, it's preserved globally. I just ran through the proof that we have in the paper that uh, they're preserved globally. And so the only thing you need to do is to prove that you have preservation by hooks, filters, merging, and end of sequence. And once again, they're all dependent on the property you want to prove here, the fact that the abstract and concrete interpretations are related. But only filters are language dependent, meaning that to prove that your abstract interpretation uh, is actually correct. The only thing you need to do is that you prove that your atoms are actually correct. Namely, that when you add two uh, numbers, uh, two abstract numbers, that correctly uh, uh, captures the fact of adding two concrete numbers. And that makes the work that we need to do on uh, such semantics much smaller. So there is a lot of uh, work related to this. Uh, I just focus on the part uh, the correct by design abstract semantics. So our approach uh, uh, goes back all the way to uh, what Dave Schmidt did in 1995, where he would prove that uh, concrete and abstract semantics were correct by relating natural semantics derivations and showing that they actually matched. And uh, we already find in his work the notion of infinite derivation corresponding to this kind of invariance. Uh, then a bit later, uh, Patrick uh, defined a systematic and compositional way of uh, directly define a precise analysis. So the main difference of what we're doing is what we're not talking about analysis here. We're talking about the semantics. Do, defining an analysis is then the next step. And uh, more recently, uh, we worked on uh, a similar approach where we were defining semantics in uh, 
uh, a pretty big step way on we show that we could uh, derive systematically uh, correct by construction abstract semantics. So to conclude, uh, what we've uh, been doing here is uh, to design a simple framework that captures the structure of semantic and making sure that we're able to uh, split the part that talk about structures from the part that talk about atoms. Then we have a generic definition of interpretations of giving meaning uh, to these semantics, where the only language dependent part is about the atoms and all the other parts are completely decoupled from your programming language. And we have proof techniques to relay these interpretations. So they, they also uh, are generic, and the only part that where you need to prove things is about the atoms. And this is all done uh, in, um, in Koch, and uh, we have the artifact available for that. So you'll find much more in the paper. Uh, you'll find an extended example where you have a wild language with heap, input, output, exceptions, and so on. Uh, we have other interpretations, including one interpretation that generates a set of constraints uh, that we show whose solution actually gets us into the abstract semantics. So that's the analysis part of this, and it is an interpretation. And uh, there is much more that we want to do starting from here. Uh, we want to look at more language features. Uh, can we capture concurrency, control operators, or go-tos? Uh, we want to build more interpretation, so we have uh, people working on uh, analysis for uh, control flow. Uh, small step semantics or abstract machines. And finally, uh, could we use this to, for instance, talk about compilation that is correct by construction, or talk about uh, type checking or separation logic? So thank you very much for your attention. OK, uh, the first uh, question I'll take from Slido. Can you give us an idea what the atoms for the C language would look like? So that would be uh, typically uh, be atom that deal with memory, like uh, reading in memory, or uh, for instance, doing uh, pointer arithmetic, or this kind of things. Uh, they're the very basic block. Uh, so to give a very simple, uh, a concrete example, sorry, um, we work a lot with JavaScript. So in JavaScript, you have a, a list of rules that look a lot like the algorithmic rule that we have. And atoms are the places where they stop defining things further, or where it's kind of informal uh, defined. Uh, I had the impression in your slide that your analyzers are Cartesian because the environment you project on each variable so the how do you do relational analysis is okay. another way of so the same the, question. Yeah, these environments they're environments for uh, the um, the interpretation they are not environment for a heap or a store or this kind of things so the, we, we don't say anything about the, 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 the domains or anything. So we could have uh, abstract values, which are uh, relational. Um, but these guys, these XF1 and all that, they are the names of our skeletal semantics. They are not neither things in the store or the heap. I have a, a more, more a comment than a question, and also a, 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 a separate answer for Patrick's uh, question. So you, you, when you referred to prior work, you referred to work in uh, the mid-90s. I think actually these ideas go back to the mid-80s. There are papers by Mycroft, Alan Mycroft and Neil Jones the, where they used uh, uh, a reinterpretation principle. The idea being that if you express the semantics in fixed meta-language and then reinterpret the primitives of the meta-language, you get an abstract semantics for free. And I think this is the, the essence of, of what you're doing. Uh, there, it was also used by, uh, as a paper by Fleming Nielsen and a thesis by Caroline Malkmier. And then uh, Jung-Hee Lim and I used it in uh, some work on machine code analysis. And in the papers on that, there is a, an answer to Patrick's question about how you do relational analysis. So, so yeah, there, there, there is a, a lot of uh, work on trying to do this thing. Uh, I think the, the, the part where we try to do it differently is we really need to be as simple as possible and mechanized to be able to capture the big thing. I think that's one of the uh, main differences. Uh, I think if you go, if you go to Jacob's, you'll see 
Another question in Slido was what about small step semantics? So, yeah, small step is a uh, tricky thing. Uh, I think the essence of small step is two things. One is uh, you need to be able to interrupt the computation. So, that we know how to do it in an interpretation. So, yeah, this is you just return whatever you were in your evaluation of the proof. Uh, the second, sorry. Yeah. So, that, that's the first part. So interrupting computation. Second part is reconstructing terms because in small step, uh, you really need to reconstruct a term such that the next time you evaluate it, you may be doing different decisions on how you are go which part you're going to evaluate, uh, which is very important for non-deterministic language, so like, such as lambda calculus with no evaluation strategy. And uh, for that, we think we have a way. The, the hardest part is when you need to make up terms. For instance, in a while loop, so the, the while constructor, uh, you cannot just say if e goes to e prime while e do s goes to e while e prime do s, that doesn't work. You need to make up a new thing. And uh, if you have a language that doesn't have if, it's kind of complex to make up a new thing. So we have a way to systematically, we think we have a way to systematically build up these new um, partial terms and reuse the one when we don't have any duplication of variables and make new terms when we do. Okay, we're out of time. Thanks again. Thank <laughs> you.